fasten your seatbelts. What are you doing? Stop. Okay. And why does this key? Uh, my computer works much better than this. All right, let's make sure that you, and these are all on Blackboard, and thank you to the person whoever, who told me that uh, that it wasn't uh, as easy to access or that it wasn't up. I've changed that. I made sure yesterday that everything was up. So you can download all of these from Blackboard. There we go. Okay, that's good enough. So now slideshow, play from current slide. There we go, voila. So the ancients, and we're talking ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, used music in much the same way we do. And music was all monophonic, one line, one voice, one instrument for a long, 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 long time. Um, the Greeks, the ancient be Greeks believed that music had divine origin and was created and performed by gods and demigods and then given to humans. Apollo, the sun god, played the lyre, which is an early harp, while Dionysus, who's the god of wine and being drunk and celebration, played a sort of flute and reveled in drama and the theater. And just like today, music was used in weddings and funerals and was even believed to have supernatural powers like healing. And today, I think we can all get behind the idea that music can be a balm to the soul. It can make us feel better. A lot of us listen to music when we're happy because it enhances our happiness. And we listen to it when we're sad because it just makes us feel better. So yeah, I think music has supernatural powers, unquestionably, for me. Um, the Greeks also laid the groundwork for our modern, modern system of harmony and melody but it wasn't codified until much, much later and is actually still evolving. The Romans used music as an essential component of religious ceremonies and military events and secular festivals and theater. Unfortunately, most traces of Roman music is thought to have been destroyed by the early Christian church. But all of the ancients used monophonic music so again, one, one note, one voice, because they hadn't really developed harmony yet. And this was copied by the early Christian church. So I'm gonna back up here and say that the, the purpose of this course exam, again is to examine evidence that exists and look at history. Unfortunately, we cannot talk about music history in the Western world without talking a lot about the Christian church. It would be kind of like trying to talk about the history of America without talking about race relations. You can't really do it because that's a big part of what made America, America. And the Christian church is a big part of what makes Western music, Western music. So I'm not espousing any faith. I'm not telling you you should be Catholic. I'm not telling you anything. I'm just looking at it from a very objective lens. So that's my, my disclaimer. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So this Roman music was copied by the early Christian church as a way to get people to join the church. Early Christians sought to use music oh, as a yes. come on, here we go. As a way, a means of inspiring the faithful. But some believed that because the pleasure in singing music distracted from the purity of religious practice and from the secret word, music should be forbid forbidden. Instrumental music, which was associated with worldly pursuits like dancing and celebration, could not be considered sacred. So for a long, long, long time, we're talking mm, 1,500 years, so for 1,500 years, instrumental music was not allowed in church. 1,500 years, music was not, instrumental music was not allowed in church. The kind of music that was played in church was the kind that I was playing for you over break. <laughs> And Jordan mentioned that, that he could meditate to this. And yeah, this is pretty meditative, and that's kind of the point. It's supposed to be a prayer.
Oops, thank you for uh, telling me that. Could you? <laughs> okay, yeah. So I just did that whole thing. Uh, I just gave you a whole bunch of words of wisdom and answers for your final exam and you couldn't hear me. That's terrible. You can hear me now, I'm assuming. Okay, uh, so let me start that again. Thank you for reminding or for letting me know that you couldn't hear me. I appreciate that. And also, if you... Uh, if you think that you should be seeing something, if I'm referring to something on the screen and you don't see it, flag me down there too, especially this week when I'm, I'm not going to be at, at home with my computer where I know what's going on. Okay, so um, in the medieval era, the church controlled everything. And this is one of the tropes, This is, and I said, listen to this, pay attention to this, perk up your ears. This is going to be one of your essay questions on your midterm and or your final. So I'm giving you final exam answers already on day two. We are going to be talking a lot about a historical pendulum. And I'm not talking about the pendulum like a grandfather clock. I'm talking about a pendulum in society that goes back and forth from emotions to science, from emotions to science, it's this great big society history pendulum. So the church controlled everything. And in the medieval era, we were on the emotional side of the pendulum. We'll talk a lot more about this as we go through. Religion explained the world. There was no other system. There was no there wasn't science in the way we knew uh, we knew as science. It was, this is what the Bible said, and this is what happened. The world was created in seven days. This is every, everything in the Bible explained everybody's life. And the Gregorian chant was the chant that was used in the church. Simple conjunct melodies, very easy to meditate to, as, as somebody said a little bit earlier. The words were very easy to understand because it didn't get in the way of the religious message. One note, one line, unison with everybody singing the same thing or solo. Now, did, did you hear my whole spiel about instrumental music in the church before you couldn't hear me? Okay, great. All right, then I, I don't have to do that again. That's good. So sacred music is music from a religion, any religion, doesn't matter what religion, not just Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever. Most of the music that we have from this medieval era is sacred. This is why only the rich and the clergy had the money and education to write things down. Only about two or 3% of the people could read. Only two of the three percent of the people could read their own language, let alone music. <clears throat> so, 
So most of the stuff was passed down the way we learned our first songs. None of us, I would be willing to bet large amounts of money, that none of us learned our ABCs by reading them. We learned the ABCs by having our parents go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and that's how we learned them. We learned to count by rote. We learned all of our things that we knew by the time we were five by listening and rote. We didn't read them. But if we never learned to read, which most people didn't in the medieval era, we'd know everything by rote. So all of the songs that we would know, we would know from the way people sang them to us. Our moms, our grandmothers, we would teach our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids, all those same songs. So most of the music we have from this era is sacred because since it was passed down orally, it wasn't written down. And those pieces were forgotten long, long ago. So we just don't have them. We have a little bit of music that isn't sacred, but not much because only the rich and the clergy had the money and education to write stuff down. Paper was expensive and ink was expensive. Women were not allowed to sing in the church because we would distract the men. We did sing and women were encouraged and expected to sing at home. We were just not allowed to sing in the church. And women and men, as is still the case in some religions, women and men were separated. In, in the Orthodox Jewish religion, women have to go upstairs and the men stay downstairs. And if you're married, you cover your head. If you're not married, you don't cover your head. And you, as a, as a woman in the Orthodox Church, you do not sing, you do not speak, you do not do anything. You go, you sit, you pray, you let the men do everything. And I, I know um, that some religions still do that, where, where the women and the men sit separately. <clears throat> and so as, as, I, as I think you, you heard that whole spiel about no instruments being allowed in the church because they were considered um, to not, not worshiping. In some religions, monophonic music is still used. Let's see if this is what I think what I think and whoa that's not what I wanted to do quit let's see if this is what I think and hope it is so this is monophonic church music And as you can hear, the words, if you spoke Latin, which everybody did, um, were very, very clear. Some religions still use monophonic music. That is an opening Shabbat on Jewish <clears throat> on Friday night, that is one of the first prayers that is used to greet, to greet the holy day, to greet the, the Shabbat, the Saturday. <laughs> this is an adhan, a call to Islamic prayer. <laughs> And very meditative, very, very pretty, in my humble opinion. Um, all a cappella, no instruments, and all monophonic, one line, one person, or one group of people. So this is the Middle Ages, where the church controlled everything. It was on the emotional side of the pendulum. No women were allowed to sing in church. Okay, move this over here, move this over here, and come down to here. There we go. The church built huge churches, huge structures to show off, to show religion. 
and to make sure that everybody knew who was in charge. Look how big this thing is. This is Notre Dame in Strasbourg, France. It was begun in 1015 and completed in 1439. Look how big it is. You can see people, full-grown adults, down here. This place is huge. Now, for us in 2023, where we have the technology and the buildings, and, and Lord knows, we live in New York City, we've seen skyscrapers. But imagine how big this is to people who, this is the only building they saw that was larger than a floor, maybe two. They all lived in shacks. This is, this is huge. This is unbelievable. This would be like us going to the moon for a Sunday morning worship. So this is Notre Dame in Strasbourg. And this is the kind of music, this monophonic music was what was used in all of these churches. So the, the legend is that Pope Gregory received melodies of plain chant of this, of this early church music from the Holy Spirit who appeared to him in the form of a dove. And you can see the dove here. This is Pope Gregory and he's dictating them to the scribe who is writing them down. This monophonic chant, one, pia one finger on the piano, one note at a time, was used exclusively until about the 10th century. And a reminder that the 10th century is the year's 900. It's 2023, but we are in the 21st century. So it was used exclusively until about the year 900 or 1000. And then they got bored and they added another melody and made it polyphony. We talked about that yesterday. So it was monophony first, then polyphony. It's hard to know when, when instruments started to be used in the church. We're not quite sure. It depended on the, depended on the religion. It depended on the church. It depended on the area of, of, the, of Europe. And most of the time, scribes only wrote text on one line. So when and by what other lines were played rather than sung, we're not quite sure. Because it could have been sung, it could have been played. We don't really know. But it wasn't, at least it was not until the, the 1300s. So 1,300 years or 400, 1,400 years or so of just singing in the church. Imagine. So as I showed you, churches and cathedrals were important sacred structures. And it reflected testimonies toward the divine power and of the church itself. And I mean capital C because it's the, the organization, the, the essentially the Catholic organization. And it also created musical performance spaces, which they did every single day because they're large and they have great acoustic qualities. And churches are reflected to or are built to construct the faithful. For example, when you look into a church and you walk into a church, what's the first thing you often see? What's the first thing that, that attracts your attention? Okay, Jesus, where? Where is he? What is, what is he doing? And there are lots of different answers to this, depending on the church you walk into, depending on, okay, and he's on the cross. Is he on the cross on the floor? The altar at the front. Yes, he's often, Jesus is often on the crucifix on the altar in the front. And is that altar lower or higher than we are? He's above you. He's higher. Good. Other than the altar, what's the other thing that we often notice in a church? The windows, exactly. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. The stained glass windows that show biblical scenes. And are those windows like the windows in your apartment that you can just go look out of? Nope. Where are they? Are they higher or lower than normal apartment windows? They're way higher. Yeah. Yeah, right. Of course, we don't, not too many of us have stained glass 
uh, windows <laughs> in our New York apartments. Although I very much like the idea. Um, so the first thing, the first place you look when you go into a church is almost always up. Whether you're looking at the crucifix on the altar or whether you're gazing up at the windows and looking at the colors of the windows, you're looking up almost all the time. What direction is heaven? What direction is God? Exactly. He's up. So you're looking toward heaven. And that is by design. The first thing you see, the first thing you do when you walk into a church is you look up, you look up toward God. And that is very, very much part of the design, even though we don't usually think of it that way. But that's, that's the point. That's why the stained glass windows are up high. That's why the altar, you usually have to go up a couple of stairs to get up to the altar. That's why the pulpit from where the, the priest or the minister or whoever preaches is often up six or seven stairs. So that's all of these things are by design by the Catholic Church and, and, to, and also by, by churches in general. And even, yeah, okay, stop. I cannot, I would love to turn this into a religious history class, but I can't do that. Okay, back, focus. Uh, so mass was the most important liturgy of the nine attended by some people every day. And it is a reenactment of the Last Supper, where you go and you listen to Bible readings, and then there's a homily where the priest interprets or helps to explain those biblical readings. And then you take communion, which is the body and blood of Christ, and you, you eat and drink some of that, and then everybody goes home. And a reminder that no women sang in church, and that all of the music and most of the, the liturgy in general was in Latin. And there are some things that everybody knew in Latin, but most people, especially the lower 95% of us who are not in that top 5% where we can read and write and study, uh, didn't speak Latin fluently. So they were going into church, listening to this entire hour of, of sermons and biblical readings and everything else in a language that we didn't really understand. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to play you just a little bit. Well, I, I did. I played you a little bit of medieval music, but now I'm going to play you a little bit of medieval secular music just so you can hear it. Medieval secular music. Here we go. Not the ad. Do. Mm. Mm. So this is still mostly monophonic, isn't it? It's a, it's a little, it's an instrument that is the precursor to the guitar, but it's still almost all one note. Once in a while he hits two notes for a chord, but not often. Those are women singing, aren't they? And that was because this is not sacred music. So women were allowed to sing in the home. They were not allowed to sing in church. So just a hint to, to remind you that we do indeed have secular music from the, the medieval era. That's all you need to know about the medieval era. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, just the, the pendulum was on the emotional side. Women were not allowed to sing in church. The church controlled everything. Not many people uh, knew how to read and write. So the vast majority of music we have is sacred. The Renaissance is <clears throat> at least a little bit closer to 
the things we know and how we where we are really going to start looking at music. The pendulum that we've talked about swings to science. So it swings from the emotional, everybody's concentrated on God in the afterlife, to science. And renaissance is the French word for rebirth. If you speak Spanish, you hear renacer in there, or in Italian, renascere. And what was being reborn? What was being reborn is a, a recovery or renewal of, of a renewed interest in the Greek and Roman antiquity. And what we now know is the humanities. If we were meeting, if this class were in person, we'd be on the QCC campus in the humanities building. And what are the humanities? It's, the, it's arts and science and philosophy in literature. It's the stuff that we like to have around, but we don't biologically need art to survive. We do not biologically need music to survive. I would not want to live life without art or music or science or, or books. And I'm, I'm going to guess, especially since you're in a music class that you wouldn't want to either, but we don't biologically need it. So the humanities is this rediscovery of how can we make life better? How can we make life better on Wednesday, May 31st at 11 a.m.? Well, let's, let's have music. Let's have art. Let's have science. Let's figure out why all of these people die and let's try to make it better. So we, they, they poked their heads out from under the medieval era where they were just like, okay, the church is all we need and we're just gonna pay attention to the church. And they said, well, wait a minute, how do we make our earthly lives better? Just because we're going to spend eternity not alive doesn't mean we can't make our life better. And this is the time of Christopher Columbus, of Vasco da Gama, of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I bring that up because they were all named, of course, after um, uh, Renaissance artists. And you may, you may know them as Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. Exactly, they were famous painters. So since I couldn't exactly write Michelangelo de Lodovico, Buonarroti, Simone on the slide, I just abbreviated it. So this, is, so this is the music, the music that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day today and a large part of tomorrow. This is the music that they were listening to. This is the, the music that Christopher Columbus was singing on his way over to the New World. Vasco da Gama, who did actually make it to Europe in 1498, and Magellan, who circumnavigated the globe, uh, it proved the world was round from 1519 to 1522. This is the music they were listening to, just to kind of put it in a little bit of context. So just because we are talking about um, rebirth and how to make life today, Wednesday, better and cultivating music and art doesn't mean that religion had any less of a sway. It doesn't mean that people were paying any less attention to religion. It just meant that how do we make life better with art and music and philosophy and and good food and all of these things that just make life better. It, it was added into there. And if you've ever heard the term Renaissance man, a Renaissance man is, is a guy who has a variety of, who, who knows everything. You can talk to him about politics, you can talk to him about art, you can talk to him about um, music, you can talk to him about a lot of stuff. He just knows everything. And that's still a term that was that's used today. So this is the background of the Renaissance era. This is what was going on. It was a big shift in the way society was thinking from church, 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 religion, 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 to, oh, wait, there's other stuff out there like art and science and music and stuff that we should we should use and do because it's fun. Many of these eras that we're going to talk about have movements associated with them, with the, um, with the culture, the society, or what was going on. And this is our first one for the semester. It is humanism. And it is a cultural movement that explored human interests and values as opposed to divine. Christina, what do you like to do? Kimari, what do you like to do? What makes you who you are? Gabrielle and Jordan, who, who are you and why are you different? Devon, why are you different than your twin brother? 
how does that work? That's, that's what humanism is. Human reason and individuality. Your personalities, exactly. But how are your personalities different? And we can answer this in spades in 2023. Jordan likes to write poetry. I think that's really cool. And I'll bet not everybody else likes to write poetry. So that's what makes Jordan different than everybody else or than, than many people is that he likes to write poetry. That's what makes us individual. And that's what humanism is. Why is your favorite color red and your sister's favorite color is blue? So science and philosophy in literature, in painting, in music, humanism, exi- that, and that's wonderful. I think that's a great form of expression. And I'd love to read some of some of your stuff, genuinely, truly. So if you care to share, email me. In music, humanism was represented or was manifested in music and pieces about the human experience. We all fall in love. We all go dancing. We, at, certainly at the time, lesser less now in America in 2023, we're, the men were all involved in battles. Um, you know, we all go to sleep listening to the crickets outside. How does, how does what we do every day affect us? So it's not just biblical music. It's music about what happens to us or poetry about what our life is like. So music started to gain expressive quality. We can meditate to the, the monophony that I was playing to for you earlier, but it's not terribly expressive. And Renaissance music became a lot more expressive. So talking about battles and anger at the enemy became louder and higher and faster because they were pissed off at the enemy. Music about going to sleep, listening to the fountain or the creek behind your, behind your hut was a different kind of music. So it became a lot more expressive because humans are expressive. We feel emotions and we need to express those emotions, whether it's through poetry or through art or through writing or through music. So that's what humanism was, exploring human interests and values. What makes you tick? The Renaissance era was from 1425-ish to about 1600. And I say ish because a lot of this is, um, and since I'm not doing slide things, I'll turn on the video for a second. Um, A lot of this stuff is about 1425 because it's like the way we develop as kids. Not one of us, I'm guessing, woke up one morning and said, okay, I'm gonna hit puberty today. I'm going to, my voice is going to drop if I'm a guy, I'm going to get hair in weird places and and my sweat's going to start to smell and I'm going to have all these hormones. And that's going to be today or tomorrow, June 1st. That's not how puberty works, right? Nor have, did we ever quinceañeras and bene mitzvot decide or the adult ceremonies that we have. Nobody wakes up and goes, okay, I'm an adult today. I haven't. I hope I never do. Adulting isn't fun, so I'm not going to do it. Um, But you, all kidding aside, you know what I mean. It's not like we we wake up one day and we decide to be an adult. And so, and society doesn't work that way either, most of the time. So the Renaissance era is from about 1425 to about 1600, depending. It hit different areas of Europe at different times. We usually think of the the Renaissance in Italy, and that's kind of that was the height, certainly, of the Renaissance since the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were all named after um, the famous Renaissance artists. So that's that's humanism and it's about, but these are the years to know, about 1425 to about 1600. Um, The other thing that, that humanism did for music was that melodic lines started to be constructed to fit the language. In other words, word painting became a thing and the, the stress of the words became important in music as opposed to the meditative monophonic thing, which was just kind of flowing and didn't have a lot of expression. 
So Renaissance music became a lot more expressive.